Spreading depolarizations are among the most overlooked pathophysiological events in brain injury. They are intense depolarization waves that occur apparently spontaneously in ischemic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, or traumatic brain injury. These are typical examples recorded during mouse filament middle cerebral artery occlusion using intracortical micropipettes placed outside the ischemic cortex. And below you see the timelines of 10 mice recorded for up to three hours. Each line shows the start and end of recordings after filament MCO onset in one mouse. And each circle is a perinfarctic polarization. And as you see, they seem to come rather unpredictably. The movie on the lower right shows oxyhemoglobin changes during these perinfarctic polarizations just to show you their propagation patterns. During injury depolarizations, there is complete loss of memory and potential in most, if not all, cells in the brain, um, including neurons and glia. And there is trans a massive transmembrane ionic shifts that last up to a minute uh, in otherwise normal brain tissue and even longer if the blood flow is compromised to the brain, um, like in case of a stroke. As you can imagine, the energy required to restore the transmembrane ion gradients impose a heavy metabolic burden. At the same time, injury depolarizations cause spasm or constriction in brain arteries, and by doing that, they reduce the blood supply. So in two parallel independent ways, injury depolarizations promote cell death. So we know that they occur in injured brain. We know all about how they propagate. We know their impact on tissue, both the metabolism and perfusion. Um, and uh, we know that they worsen the outcome. But we have no clue about why and how injury depolarizations are triggered in the first place. It has been a complete mystery. Now, uh, this is important because the drugs that we have to um, suppress injury depolarizations are potent drugs, um, and they have a lot of side effects. Um, so they are not always clinically feasible to be used. So if we understood why injury depolarizations are triggered uh, in the first place, we could try uh, and take away the trigger and prevent them from happening. And that was really the purpose behind our study, uh, to understand how and why injury depolarizations are triggered. Perinfarct tissue, by definition, is critically hypoperfused and has stable supply-demand mismatch, but it is not yet depolarized. In other words, anoxic depolarization has not yet taken place. We hypothesized that any transient worsening in supply-demand mismatch would precipitate anoxic depolarization in a susceptible focus, which would be a trigger for a spreading injury depolarization. In other words, supply-demand mismatch transients would trigger injury depolarizations. To test our hypothesis, we used distal middle cerebral artery occlusion in mice. So we used a small microsurgical clip to occlude the M2 branch of middle cerebral artery and thereby set a distinct perfusion defect that was part-wise overlapping with the somatosensory cortex. To detect perinfarctal polarizations, we used full-field laser speckle flowmetry, a high-resolution, at the same time also non-invasive method to optically visualize the blood flow in the cortex. To also measure the local O2 supply-demand mismatch, we used a combination of laser speckle flowmetry and multispectral reflectance imaging of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin in the cortex. Of course, we also maintained a monitored systemic physiology of all animals using arterial lines, endotracheal intubation, and mechanical ventilation. This was not only to ensure stable blood pressures and good blood gases, including pH, PCO2, and PO2, but also to be able to manipulate them to test our hypothesis. So our data show that a transient decrease in oxygen supply, such as during hypoxic or hypotensive transients, or a transient increase in oxygen demand upon functional activation can precipitate an injury depolarization. One reason injury depolarizations have been underappreciated is the fact that they are not easy to detect clinically. As of today, only invasive recording devices implanted over or inside the brain can reliably detect injury depolarizations in humans. The COSBIT collaboration, launched 10 years ago for the first time, managed to show in a large number of patients how prevalent injury depolarizations were in human stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, and traumatic brain injury. Spreading depolarization occurs in almost 100% of patients with malignant hemispheric stroke. In our study, we investigated seven patients um, who had a total of 131 spreading depolarizations in which we also measured 
the tissue partial pressure of oxygen with a Lycox probe between electrode 3 and 4. We found that the tissue partial pressure of oxygen was significantly lower 5 minutes before spreading depolarization than under control or baseline conditions. Now, of course, um, everything in our study applies to the acute stroke stage. There is no question that somatosensory um, and environmental en enrichment improves recovery after all types of brain injury. But when that becomes beneficial is an open question. Um, is it best to enrich the environment two days after a stroke? One week? How about a few weeks? We simply don't know. All we know is that it is beneficial. It is good for the patient during the recovery stage, but we don't know when that recovery stage um, starts. Now, in this study, we present the proof of concept in ischemic stroke, but we believe the principle applies to all brain injury states. Uh, of course, it will take much more work to test them in, um, in intracranial hemorrhage um, or traumatic brain injury.